YouTube, it's Missy, and today I'm here to share with you guys my December wrap-up for 2020. I read seven books in the month of December, and I gave five of those books four stars, and I have two five stars. I'm going to be telling them to you in the order of how I read them, like which ones I finished first. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. The first one I want to talk about is Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and The Birth of the FBI by David Grant. Now, I buddy read this with Ashley. This is a nonfiction. Um, I gave it four stars, and it was devastating. So this takes place in the 1930s, where um, a whole bunch of Native Americans were pushed out of Oklahoma. Um, at first they were like in this certain place and then the government said you guys need to move back and then they did and then they said you need to move back again and they kept pushing and pushing pushing and then finally the Osage Indians ended up on this very rocky terrain where you know nothing could grow there. So they knew that the government wouldn't want to take over that particular piece of land because it wasn't good for vegetation. But lo and behold, one day they struck oil. And the white people obviously wanted to get in on the action because where there is money, there is people who want to take advantage of you. And the people at the top in the United States is the white people. So what they did was they made this deal with the Indians. There were people that were in charge of the Indians um, as their spokesperson because you couldn't be an Indian and just talk to the government. You needed to have a white person as your spokesperson. They created this agreement, this contract that said that uh, the Native Americans got the oil money, like all of the oil money. That was their head right. They got everything. And then the they could um, lease out land to whoever wanted to purchase or like rent out the land and put oil rigs on to pump the oil out. And then whatever they got for the oil, they would have to give a percentage to the Native Americans. So that worked for a little bit until more white people started moving in to Oklahoma into this area and wanted more in the action. So what they would do is they would marry into the Native Americans, especially those that had head rights. And then once that was established, once they were able to either marry into or become best friends with or become their, um, like, keepers, where, um, I, I don't know what the word, the term is called, but... The, you had to ask them for money, so then they would go to the bank for you and then give you the money that you're requesting. Um, yeah, so these Indians were being killed off, these Native Americans. They, the white men were marrying these Native American women, getting them drunk, and then murdering them, and then stealing their head rights, burning down their houses, um, just... <laughs> Left and right, there was murder. And then the FBI comes into play, where uh, J. Edgar Hoover is all like, I expect the FBI to be this, 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 and this. They can only be educated people. I want them to be college students. Um, I don't care if they've never dealt with criminals before because everybody needs to be book smart instead of street smart. And when you have criminals, criminals do not read books for crime. So you're more than likely to catch a criminal if you have street smarts. <laughs> but that wasn't fancy enough for J. Edgar Hoover. And so he had like these under um, cover kind of cops that were set sent into Oklahoma to make him look better, but then he gave them no credit. You know, they, they did all the work, and then he said, oh, thanks to the FBI, but he didn't name names. And the one man, the main guy, um, his last name is White, just so happens to be White, um, he continued to do things for J. Edgar Hoover, and then he 
he never reciprocated. He was such a taker, a taker of everything, of, of popularity and esteem and, um, you know, privilege and all of this stuff. And then he wouldn't, like, give out any compliments or, you know, give it to the, the, the little man, you know? <sighs> Frustrating. And J. Edgar Hoover was essentially also racist, so... <laughs> God, this book, I, I could literally go on and on and on and on about how I feel terrible uh, being white through proxy. You know what I mean? Like, my grandma wanted me to read this story because it affected her so deeply. And she took a Native American course in college when she was younger, and that, like, devastated her. And so she says the same thing. I feel terrible being white by proxy. It's like, no, I wasn't the one to kill these Native Americans, and my family wasn't the one to kill these Native Americans, and my white side of the family came from Prussia to get away from oppression and come to the United States for a better life because that's what the United States is all about. Um, you know, the freedom to pursue your dreams. And yet we have these people who have to be crapped on, stepped on in order to go up in the world. And I, I hate climbing the ladder by stepping on others. And that's exactly what these greedy bastards did back in the 30s. And it was the 30s. It wasn't even like, like hundreds of years ago. It was 1930. It, it's astounding <laughs> how people were treated even even just recently. That's all I want to say. This book is very well written. It's got all of the information that you need. He did a lot of research. He talked to the families that used to live there back in the 30s or at least their um, you know their family members that are still alive. He talked to museum um, people who, accumulated information from that time period. He did a lot of research from what he could get and a lot of people were willing to help him get that information for this book. So I gave it a four star because it was absolutely well written. It has all of the history that you need. This is something that needs to be taught in school because you don't learn about this stuff. All you learn about is the Trail of Tears and how the Native Americans were, you know, pushed away and, and massacred for their land. But you don't hear that it's almost like a modern day tale as well. Like it happened recently. In the last hundred years it happened. And that's disgusting. And it fear infuriates me. And I hate I hate reading about racism and how people are just treated so poorly for something that they can't change. You know, if someone treats you like crap because you're an asshole, that's something that you can change. You can try to do better. You can't change the color of your skin. It's not fair to be treated uh, uh, terribly because of something you're born with. It, I, I, that's, this is already enough. It's enough. I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. Um, the next book that I read in December was My Sister the Serial Killer by Oyenkin Brathwaite. Brathwaite. Uh, this is a Nigerian author. Really enjoyed this story. This is another buddy read, read that I read with Ashley. Um, and this takes place in Nigeria. We have two sisters. One that is like an Instagram influencer and then one that's a nurse. She's a head nurse of the hospital in the place that they live. I can't remember what the town is called but there's Ayula which is the little sister and Koredi which is the older sister. Now Ayula is the one who's killing people and you know that from the front of the cover. It's not like it's a mystery. Um, she, she kills her boyfriends and then her sister the nurse cleans up the mess. That's the whole book. But Coretti is trying to figure out how to get her sister to stop doing it. And essentially 
the sister's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they won't let their mom know that this is happening because the mom believes that this little sister can do no wrong. And Coretti, the older sister, is just like, why does everybody hate me? Um, why do I have to look like my mother? I think it's the mom that she looks like, or maybe it's the dad. I don't know. Coretti is very dark-skinned, and she's got, like, big lips and a big face, whereas Ayula looks more um, lighter-toned, and she's got smaller features, and she, looks, she just looks more beautiful to the eyes of the people around her. And so uh, there's favoritism in the family. Usually the case is the baby's always the favorite, and so the sisters bicker and fight. The mom never wants to be on the older sister's side. And, I mean, that's basically the story. What you don't see from the synopsis is how it it affects Coretti and, and what happens at the end, which I found to be very accurate. Um, it, it's hard to to go against blood when you know, it's your blood. If, if my, I have two sisters. If one of my sisters killed somebody, and I'm being very, very truthful here, I don't know if I would go to the police and be like, my sister killed someone. I don't know if I would help clean up the mess, but I think I would pretend it didn't happen. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I mean, this is a hypothetical situation. Uh, I would think I would, wouldn't lie to, like, the police for them, but I might. I don't know. I'm not in that, again, I'm not in that situation, but I love, love, love my sisters, and if it was, like, a self-defense kind of thing, I think I would be for them. If they were just killing guys just, just to do it, I might have second thoughts. I would still love them, of course, but I don't know. It's a very... <laughs> very strange subject. Um, okay, the next book that I read was Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. This is the second time I've read this story. The first time I was reading it to my kids, and then this time around I read it to my students. Um, every single year the third grade reads this book, and um, because we are distance learning, I was able to read to the children. I'm glad the last three chapters I didn't have to read to my kids at school because the last three chapters is when Charlotte dies and that always makes me cry and Wilbur's devastated and I I hate that if you haven't seen this movie please watch it it's so good the the book and the movie is exactly the same just you know animation is so much more fun I really enjoy uh Wilbur and Fern and you know, Charlotte and all the gang. Templeton's a, a, a major me in the book, though. Like, Templeton's not as rude in the movie. He's really, really rude in the book. Like, he's like, I hope you die. Who cares? Nobody wants you. They're going to turn you into bacon. Like, come on! Why are you being such a dick? All right. The next book uh, that I read in December was None Shall Sleep. This is a new 2020 release. This is by... Ellie Marnie, I buddy read this with Ashley. This is, uh, these go together. So we have the, um, the YA serial killer book, and then we have the adult serial killer book, and then we are currently right now reading um, Man from the Train, which is a serial killer book that's a nonfiction. Uh, let me know down below what you guys think about my theme reading between the genres. I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it's nice to see how YA writers take on a subject, how adult authors take on a subject, and how the subject is actually, you know, worded in nonfiction. All right, so this one got a four star. I know that on Goodreads this got five stars from a lot of like high um, book reviewers. There is a person I follow, Chelsea, I don't know what her last name is, but she wrote, uh, gave this a five. And I typically trust her reviews. Uh, the reason why I didn't give this one a five is because it's so uh, similar to um, Silence of the Lambs. Now, <clears throat> With that being said, I purchased this book because it said it was the Silence of the Lambs for YA. And I was thinking, oh, 
a book similar, similar, not exactly similar to Silence of the Lambs. And then, so I, I'm reading this entire book, and then I'm discussing it with Ashley in text messages. And then when we really, when we got to the end, the the author notes all of the books that she was inspired by. And I was like, you basically plagiarized all of those books. So let's get into this book, shall we? We have two main characters. We have um, Emma and we have um, Travis. Now, Travis is Travis Bell. He, he hardly is ever called Travis in the book. He just is called Bell. And then Emma is never you know, called by her last name. She's always called by her first name. So I don't know why the boy gets to be called by his last name. Regardless, uh, so we have two main characters, Emma and Belle, and they are um, handpicked from this man named Cooper, who works for the FBI, that wants them to go out and interview teenage serial killers. So very mind hunter esque Okay, so we have two people going into prisons or mental hospitals and they are interviewing the serial killers and trying to figure out why and how and when they decide to kill people. Now, one of the people that they have to interview is a man, well, he's 18, so I mean, he's a man, but, you know, still kind of a child. Uh, what's his name? I forgot because it's long, Gut, Gutmanson, his name's Simon. So they interview Simon and uh, only Emma goes in because Travis or Belle doesn't want to interview Simon. So only Emma goes in. So she's kind of like our Clarice of the book. And she goes in, she talks to Simon and when she gets into the mental hospital, Simon is set in this cell in the middle of something that looks like a chapel. So it probably was a chapel at one point but that's where they put him because he's so dangerous, okay? And as the the cell is described exactly like the cell on Silence of the Lambs, where Hannibal is, is being, um, you know, kept at. Now, not the cell in the mental hospital, where it's like a glass wall and everything, uh, but the cell that the police officers are holding him in before he's transported. If you've seen the movie Silence of the Lambs and you know what I'm talking about. So Simon's in this cell just like that. He's got this curtain that he has to go stand behind um, because when um, the guard has to give him things, the guard's not allowed to get close. He has to use these like pinchers to give him stuff. Uh, Simon's not allowed to have like pens and paper clips and staples things like that. Simon talks just like Hannibal. So it's almost like Ellie like literally just took Hannibal and put it into Simon or like Simon was his son or something. They're so similar. It, it went beyond, you know, inspiration. It was very close to plagiarism. Like, um, Simon's very intrigued by her. He, he thinks that she's a puzzle. Uh, she's very bright. He's interested. He treats her differently. Um, just like Hannibal didn't kill Clarice in the movie, Simon has the same kind of, not love, but like attraction to Clarice because, or Clarice, he, Simon has um, an attraction to Emma because she is so different than most girls you know she she has that that sparkle that he really likes her essence um, draws him to her the only thing that's different between Simon and Hannibal is Simon doesn't eat his victims and he has a, a twin sister okay so we have the mine hunter aspect we got the two kids interviewing all these serial killers. And then on top of that, we have the main um, murder mystery, which is just like Red Dragon. I'm telling you. <laughs> and the fact that the, the author put all of this in her inspiration portion of the about the author kind of thing really tells you how 
inspiration is a very fine line, you know, between that and plagiarism. And again, it's not plagiarized. It's not word for word. It's just so similar that I had to give this story a four star and a five star because it's it's too similar for my taste. Um, so the murder mystery acting like Red Dragon, we have a, a criminal who um, writes to Simon in a newspaper personal ad, just like in Red Dragon. And then we have the FBI aspect, just like in Silence of the Lambs, where Cooper is trying to keep um, Clarice, you know, or for instance, in this case, Emma and Travis, um, out of the limelight because he doesn't want them to get hurt because, again, they are teenagers. Um, overall, like I said, this book would have been a five-star read if not for the really, like, major similarities in the story process. Like, characters were too similar, scenarios were too similar. Um, if you aren't familiar with Thomas Harris and you've never read Silence of the Lambs or Red Dragon and you haven't seen Mindhunter the TV show and you haven't read any of those books and you don't know anything about the FBI or... Um, Quantico, then yeah, maybe this is a five-star read and this is right up your alley. Um, however, since I am so um, invested in murder mysteries, thrillers, crime, <laughs> uh, you know, f f the FBI, serial killers, I really knew all of this information going in. And so uh, it was hard for me to to see th this as its own separate identity. So, like I said, uh, would have been a five if not for so many similarities. Okay, the next book I read in December was The Secret Place. This is book five in the Murder Dublin Murder Squad by Tana French. I buddy read this with Maddie. We're almost finished with this <laughs> series. I think Trespasser is the last one in the series, and then there is um, The White Elm. I think there's like a spin-off, or at least there's more books written by Tana French that Maddie and I are interested in reading, you know, just to continue on with our love of Tana French. So this also got a four, and I have to say, I, we've been reading this series for so long that we know the formula in in how Tana French writes, at least within this series. So we know that it's going to start off with a detective or maybe two, like a team. We know that it's going to follow a murder mystery that is very close to the detective, either it takes place in a town that the detective knows very much about because it's his hometown. Uh, they visited it often. Uh, it it took place in the same place that someone else died. Like, there's, there's a, a very personal reason for the detective to be a part of the case in all of these books. And that's not any different in this one. We follow two detectives. We have... Um, Stephen Moran and Antoinette Conway. Now, Conway worked on this case, which was at the Kilda Girls School. So Kilda and Colmes are two um, schools right next to each other, like private boarding schools, one for girls, one for boys. And it's a very richy, uppity, you know, you have to be... Um, you know, you have to have money in order to go to this school. And so one year, this boy named Christopher uh, Harper, Christopher Harper is murdered on the school grounds, on the girls' school grounds. And the detectives, Conway and her partner at the time, um, what is his name? Not Carlos. Castillo. Castillo. That was his last name. Um, anyways, they worked the case, and now it's gone cold. They, they interviewed all of the girls, all of the boys. They couldn't figure out what happened to Christopher, how he died. Um, they had arrested 
the groundskeeper at one point, um, but they it wouldn't stick. He he wasn't involved, and so it went cold. And then what we have is um, a girl named um, uh, Mackie, Mackie, Holly, Holly Mackie, who comes in and talks to Stephen Moran, who works in cold cases. He also worked with her when she was 10, when she was a witness to a murder. And so um, she trusts him. And so she comes to him with this uh, card that she has found at the secret place. Now the secret place is a bulletin board in the girls' like common room. And that's where you go to put your your hopes, your dreams, your wishes, your secrets, you know, all of this stuff goes on the bulletin board, very anonymous, nobody knows. But, you know, the girls kind of know. If they know your handwriting, then they know who put it up there. Anyways, um, Holly's like, oh, this this looks important, and so she brings it as evidence to Stephen Moran, and he's just, like, really excited because Stephen works in the cold cases, but he really wants to work in murder. That's where everybody wants to work, um in Dublin, like at the at the department, the police department, there's all these like units. And like I said, he works in cold cases, but he wants to be in murder. So he takes the evidence, the new evidence to Conway, who was the main detective of that case. And he brings it to her and she's just like, oh, well, let's go. And he really wants to weasel his way in on this case. And so she's just like very skeptical, very, um, if he, she doesn't trust very well, and so she allows him to tag along, and that's where the story takes place. The whole thing takes place at Kilda's. Now, the thing that's different between this book and all of the other books in this series is that it's two points of view. We don't just have the detective side, we have the girl's side too, which I didn't like at the beginning, and as the, the book went on, I liked it more, but at the very beginning, I hated it. So we have each each chapter is um, take there. It takes turns. So we have the ca uh, <laughs> the captains. We have the detectives on campus looking and and interviewing the girls again, and then we have the girls in the past. Uh, you know, a year earlier and how everything went down and who they are. And then there's eight girls all together that we are watching. We have Joanne's group, she's the mean girl. She has all of her little posse that follow her around because she's the leader. And then we have Julie's group who are actually best friends. There is no real leader. I mean, Julie is technically, I guess you can say the leader, but they are all equal in their love and respect and admiration for one another. Whereas Joanne, um, craps on, on her minions like she's got minions whereas Julie has best friends and so there's a rivalry between the two um, we have the mean girls and like the weirdos um, because the girls don't conform to stupid cliche ways of how girls are supposed to be boy crazy money hungry um, stupid <laughs> I hate that women are, are looked at like that kind of adjectives. You know what I mean? So um, the, the detectives are interviewing the girls, and they're taking them on a wild goose chase. And for a long time, you're very irritated while you're reading this because you're like, just spit it out. These girls are hiding something. We know this as the reader. They're hiding something, but they're like giving the, the detectives like little breadcrumbs to follow. And we're trying to figure out who is, who did it? Who's the killer? It, it has to be one of these eight. It has to be. And every single, like every single time I thought it was somebody, it wasn't. Up until literally the very last two chapters, I was like, oh no, are you serious? And again, this is another reason why I like buddy reading so much because I have the ability to text Maddie while we're reading going oh, what do you think about this theory and what do you think what what do you think's happening next and, and blah, blah blah so that's a lot of fun um i'm i'm giving this a four star because it was such a devi uh, 
um, how do I say that word? A deviation? Yeah, <laughs> that's how you say it. It's such a big deviation from the original uh, formula of her books and how they're written. Because this is so different, it caught me off guard and I didn't like the first like third of the book. But then once I was getting used to the POVs and the time jumping, uh, I really liked it because the the detectives would have a theory and then the girls would be like, this is actually what happened. And then the detectives would talk and be like, well, this is who we think that ha what happened. And then the girls would talk about the past going, nope, this is actually what happened. So it was, it was a cool little like slow um, <laughs> reveal of, of who the killer is. And that way you could form your own um, ideas and theories on how these girls are and who they are as people and and um, so forth. But there is a slight like witchy paranormal vibe that's not really touched upon in this book that was kind of weird. Um, I liked it but at the same time it never actually was talked about by the narrator. I mean the narrator there's the, the two POVs. The first one is Stephen Moran. He's the narrator of the two detectives. But then with the girls, it's like this, you know, omnipresent narrator that just knows everything. And that narrator never says anything about the paranormal aspect. It just drops out of the story, um, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, so be aware of that. But yeah, four stars. All right, and then the last two books that I read, I read and finished them both um, on New Year's Eve. This one I read in one whole day because I had to. <laughs> and that is Up to This Point by Jennifer Longo. This is a YA contemporary about a girl who is a ballerina. So we have um, Harper, and she likes to be known that she's not called Harper because of um, To Kill a Mockingbird. That's not why her father named her Harper. She emphasizes that quite a lot in the book. Um, so Harper and her best friend Kate uh, met in Simone's uh, ballet studio when they were three. So for the last 14 years they've had the plan. They've been planning on becoming San Francisco ballerinas since they were three years old. So they have been watching their what they eat. They have been exercising like like practicing dancing at every moment in time. Um, they have been very studious so that way they could graduate early in order to try out for the San Francisco Ballet when it comes time because they they normally pick their prima ballerinas and the people who are going to be part of the core um, in like February, but school usually doesn't end until June, you know? So they got out early in December so that way they could both join and, and try out for the San Francisco Ballet. So uh, Harper is very, very, very determined to be a ballerina. But the thing is, it has kind of reminded me of Center Stage, and I love, love stories about ballerinas, and I love watching movies about ballerinas. I don't know why I'm obsessed with ballerinas. But Center Stage is like one of my favorites. And um, we know in Center Stage, uh, the main character doesn't have the perfect body type, Jodie Sawyer. She doesn't have good feet, um, and she essentially is being like kicked out of school because um, they don't think that she has a chance to become a professional. And so the same thing happens with Harper. Uh, right off the bat, you know, she works twice as hard as Kate. Kate is um, a ballerina through and through. Not only does she have the talent, but she has the love, she has the drive. And so she's perfect. Whereas um, Harper doesn't have the talent. She just has the love and the drive. And that that's good for teaching ballet, but not for being a professional ballerina. And so Simone brings her aside and she's just like, look, I really think that you should be a teacher. I will send you to London. You will, you can learn with the best. You can learn with the London uh, ballet to be a teacher because that's, uh, uh, that's what she does. Um, every day, Harper 
teaches the kindergarten kids and the babies ballerina to get money in order to pay for classes at Simone's ballet studio because uh, her family isn't super rich, whereas Kate's family is super rich and she is able to just pay for all of these lessons and everything, whereas Harper has to pay for them herself. Um, Kate just gets it for free. And so there's that's the big difference between the two best friends. Like, Kate's always had it easy. Harper ha has always had to work really hard for it. And when Harper, you know, learns that Simone isn't, you know, sticking up for her and she doesn't believe that she can do it, Harper decides that um, she needs to get away. She needs quiet. She needs solitude. She needs to find herself. She needs to know what she wants to do with her future. She feels lost, almost dead. That's like when someone says, you know, breaks up with you. It, it essentially feels like she's breaking up with ballet, the love of her life. And um, Harper's also a Scot. So there's like two sides of this story, which I really enjoyed the mesh. It just doesn't make, normally you wouldn't see this. And I loved how um, Jennifer Longo was able to put them both together. So Harper is in love with ballet. She's in love with San Francisco. I have never been in love with a place that I've lived. Like I've, I was in love with Hawaii when I lived there. I've never loved California. I hate living in this state. Um, I don't like sunshine. <laughs> I'm a weirdo like that. I would much rather have clouds and, and rain and snow and cold weather where you have to wear layers. Sun really irritates me. I don't want to be hot and sweaty. So, uh, tangent. Um, so Harper really, really loves San Francisco, but she has to leave it in order to find herself. And she's a Scot, which means that there's three uh, main explorers of Antarctica. There was A, a Mudson, um, Scott, and Shackleton. I've only heard of Shackleton. I haven't heard of the other two. But she's related to Scott, who was an explorer of Antarctica. And using her last name and the fact that her mom knows some people that work um, at the, what's it called? Oh, what's it called? There's it, there's a an actual place, McMurdo. McMurdo is the station that the scientists live at at Antarctica. So um, Harper she gets accepted to go to Antarctica, and she spends the winter there. So for six months, she's in Antarctica trying to figure out what she's going to do with the rest of her life. And what I loved so much about this is, one, this is not my first Jennifer Longo book. I did read her very first book with Six Feet Under It, Six Feet Over It. Um, Jennifer Longo is such an amazing writer. She's a screenwriter, and she says that she thinks in terms of scenes and not chapters. So it just works really well with with the... With the layout of the story. I mean, you really get an essence that you're there. Not only that, but she writes so realistically. Like, I I don't like reading YA when it comes to, like, girls and school because they're very flighty. They're always, like, the cliche, like, um, dumb blondes, popular blondes, popular mean girls, um, boy crazy, uh, two timing, triangles, I like him, she likes me, I like them. It's always about romance and, and curfews and all of this stuff, right? The parents are never in the stories. The, the kids run amok. Um, they have all this money but no jobs. Like, I've read loads of YA, at least a hundred probably more throughout the last seven years. And I like these ones because Harper has a goal. She sticks to that goal. She is determined and works very hard for that goal. She's smart. She's um, talented, kind, caring. Uh, she works well with the with children. She loves animals. Her parents are both in the picture. They are sappy, loving human beings. Her brother um, 
is super cute Luke. There is Star Wars aspects of this um, of this book. Owen is a love interest for Harper and it's very slow. It's not like falling in love all at you know love at first sight. They take it very very slow. Owen is an Asian character, um, so it, it touches on on race a little bit. Um, Owen really wants to date Harper. His parents don't like Harper because she's white. The traditionally the Chinese moms want their Chinese sons to marry Chinese women or you know girls uh, to keep the Chinese in the family. And so we have that aspect. And so it's very realistic and homey feeling and and you feel you know all of this for Harper you don't you don't hate any of the characters in this book you truly are are just wanting to see where it leads and then we have the Antarctica aspect so we get to Antarctica we get to see all of the things that happen at McMahon McMurdo. Um, the lady that she is assisting is a black woman and it talks about um, how it's it's not only hard to be a black person in, in science, but it's hard to be a black woman in science. And on top of that, it's hard to be a black woman in science trying to um, start something and get your uh, your like diploma and your job based on something that nobody uh, believes in. In this case, um, the the teacher is really trying to save the penguins and uh, I liked that that was all included because it's absolutely true and so um, I mean the only fictional aspect of this is that McMurdo would never allow teenagers to be in Antarctica you, that doesn't happen but they do have college students go for science um, so yeah I really liked I liked that when uh, Harper got to Antarctica, that she suffered while she was there, that the girl that she's supposed to be assisting with, not the teacher, but there's two assistants for that science, like, chaperone teacher kind of thing, and the other girl doesn't like her, and they slowly start building a relationship over those six months. And that, again, is so realistic. It wasn't like, hate you forever, or I like you right away. It's, it was a slow-burning um, relationship for everybody. It, it was all so beautifully written. I loved it so much, and I gave it five stars. Um, six feet over it, uh, I think I gave that one four stars. So I, I definitely am going to be picking up more of this author in the future. I just really enjoy her writing. And if you like ballerinas or you like Antarctica or you just want a, a sweet um, coming of age contemporary that isn't like dramatic. There's not a lot of drama in it and it's got some wholesome kids definitely pick this up. All right, and then the very last book that I read in December is The Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. Now, I, I've told you guys this in several videos. Uh, this is my fourth book of Simone St. James, but the first one I've ever read. I do own three other ones on my shelves, and I've been, like, ignoring them for some reason. Thank God this came out, and it was something that was interesting, so now I know what she writes like all of the books have ghosts in it but now that I know how her writing style is and how it works well with what I like I'm definitely going to pick up those other three that are on my historical fiction shelf these we're following the first one which is Vivian Delaney and that one takes place in Fell 1982 and then we have the second POV which is um our main character, who is Carly Kirk, and this one takes p place in Fell in 2017. Now, first we hear about Delaney, now, or Viv. Viv is her nickname. Um, she comes to Fell, New York, on a whim, and it's kind of accidental. So she runs away from home. She's sick of her mother. Uh, 
her sister and her don't get along, and she decides she's going to be an actress in New York. So she leaves, and she catches a bus going up there, but they stop at, like, you know, restroom breaks or whatever, and somehow she misses the bus. Like, she leaves the bathroom too late, and the bus is leaving, and then she is stuck, stranded. So she hitches a ride, and the man's kind of creepy, and so finally she gets too uncomfortable to be in the car anymore, and she's like, can you just drop me off? And he goes... We're in Fell. And she goes, that's okay. Just drop me off. I, I'll call a friend and have them. He's like, where you wanted to go is like maybe, you know, 30 minutes away. I don't mind driving you there. And she's like, no, no. <laughs> I'll get out. And so she ends up getting stuck in this little town. Uh, she meets a roommate named Jenny. They both have night shifts. Viv starts working at the Sundown Motel. It's very weird. There's ghosts there. She wants to figure out why these ghosts are haunting the hotel. Jenny tells her about all of these murders and disappearances in Fell. And Viv is very, like, one of those girls that are, like, very obsessed with serial killers and crime and wants to solve it herself. And so she goes through the process of figuring out who these dead women are. And then we have Carly Kirk. 35 years later, in 2017, she's in college, her mom just died, her brother thinks that she's, you know, crazy to do this, but she decides that she's going to leave college, take a break, and go to Fell and search for her aunt. Her aunt is Viv Delaney. No one knew what happened to Viv 35 years ago. The mom died, um, you know, heartbroken because she never found her sister. So Carly decides she's going to go to Fell and walk through the streets and try to figure out the clues and come to a decision on what happened to her aunt. So when Carly arrives in Fell, again, it's 2017, so there's cell phones and internet and all of this stuff. She reaches the apartments that her aunt used to live in, and she's like searching for um, the actual apartment number when um, she sees like a, a notice saying, oh, hey, I'm looking for a roommate, yada, yada. Um, and she starts walking up the stairs and out comes Heather. And Heather goes, hey, are you the girl who wanted to come see the apartment? And Carly's like, what? And so she kind of like plays along and then she finally says, confesses, no, actually, I'm here looking for my aunt, Viv Delaney. And Heather's like, stop, wait, I know that name. She's like, I lived here my whole life. I am obsessed with killings and the disappearances of the women from Fell. I can tell you all about her. And so Carly's like, oh, yes, I've reached the pinnacle. Uh, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And so Heather says, just live with me. And Carly goes, well, I don't have any money. And Heather goes, that's fine. My parents pay for this place anyway. Just stay here with me and we'll figure it out together. And that's what they do. And then when Carly goes to look at the Sundown Motel, she sees that there is a wanted poster in the window for a night clerk. So she ends up working the same shift as her aunt and seeing the same ghosts that her aunt saw and then following the same clues her aunt did to locate these missing women and to figure out the killer. So it's coinciding. What I loved about it so much was the fact that Viv would do something in the past and then Carly would finish up it's like, you know, when you have a best friend and you guys say the same thing or like you finish each other's sentences, the same thing with this. Vivian would start the, the, the story off and then Carly would finish it in what, what's taking place in the, in the present. And then Vivian would show a little bit, a snippet of the past and then Carly would bring up what's happening now in the future and so, or in the present. So I liked the back and forth, the different POVs, and the, diff the time jumps. I liked how they complemented each other. Um, the, mur the murder mystery was great. I didn't expect the ending whatsoever. Well, I kind of suspected towards the end, but um, I didn't know it was going to go down that way. And, uh, yeah, I really liked it. Five-star read. So... That is my December wrap-up. I hope you enjoyed that. I know it's a little long, but I did 
do a review for seven books. Um, and that is it. Let me know down below what you guys finished in December. Have you read the books that I read this month? Did you like them? Are you planning on reading the books that I read? Did I make you want to read them? Um, yeah, that is it. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week. And I will talk to you guys soon.